You should be reading at the speed of thought. So in this episode, this is going to be about um, the way we do things, the way we apply techniques, and how I think we stand too closely to the techniques that we employ. And it doesn't have to be a technique that's super deliberate that you're working on now. It could just be how you were taught. So I'm going to use reading as an example. And, uh, and then, again, relate that as I usually do to kind of broader things, just really anything in life. But let's use reading as an example. Now, reading is something that I've been, and I've talked about this before, I kind of like working on it. And by working on it, I mean thinking about different ways to achieve it, to assimilate the information. I mean, reading is obviously important. We read books, we read articles, write blog posts, whatever it is, scientific journals. And, uh, you know, we're consuming information and we want to do that to learn how the world works, what people think of things, maybe get inspired. I often argue that, you know, real learning isn't going to come from reading, it's going to come from building and creating things, but reading is important. So anyway, so I think reading is important. I like reading, I like pouring over books, and, and I do a fair amount of it. But I don't just do it to consume, I do it as a creative act. And I think treating reading as a creative act um, is the true education, because like any type of creating, um, you're trying to achieve something that is not yet achieved. In your own little way, you're bringing something new into the world, or into your world anyway. Um, you know, you're, it's, it's kind of like you're fashioning something and that's odd to say about reading, but if you treat reading, uh, as a creative act, meaning, um, as opposed to just consuming the information, you deliberately think about how to maybe have it go better. How can I scan my eyes across the page more effectively? How can I assimilate the information more effectively? Um, how can I retain the information? You know, how can I improve the comprehension? Now that might sound like taking the joy out of reading. But I think if you're a kind of a creative individual, that's kind of fun because it's not just the consumption of the, of the information on the pages, which may or may not be that particularly interesting or that important. Books are unfortunately, a lot of books out there are filled with a lot of filler. You might get halfway through the book and then realize you're not that interested. You know, whatever, for, for a number of reasons, there's only so many good, you know, maybe 10% of the books you pick up are worthwhile, even if they're recommended and you thought about it, right? But if you treat it as a creative act, like even if it was a bad book, the, the act of reading itself where you're, you're, you're trying to almost come up with maybe a new technique or a way to not just enjoy the book, but assimilate the information and maybe regurgitate it or, I don't like that word, but kind of uh, just speak about it after the fact, right? There's ways to visualize concepts in the mind. Um, there's ways to scan the eyes across the page. There's different things you can do to make the act of reading far more effective. And I just find that interesting. Again, it treats reading as a creative act. Now this might not be interesting to you, you might not care about reading in general, or you don't want to change the way you read. That's fine. This isn't really about reading. I'm just going to use that as an example of something that um, can go well or can go not well, depending on how closely you stand to the technique. Um, because really, I'm not a huge fan. I understand the role of techniques, but techniques can really get in your way if you stand too close to them. So what do I mean by that? So let's take reading as an example. And... One thing you can do to improve your reading, improve uh, generally means comprehension. It could also mean speed, but it doesn't necessarily have to be fast because maybe the slower reading is better. Um, but let's just use kind of speed reading as an example. If, you, if you've ever looked into that, they have some techniques in there and they involve things like suppressing subvocalization. Um, so vo subvocalization is when you hear the words in your head while you're reading. Most of us probably do that to some extent, right? Like if you just read some text, on a page, you probably kind of hear the words in your head. Uh, it also tells you how to increase your peripheral vision, um, how to kind of read more photographically, how to smooth the uh, cicadas or whatever it's called, the eye movement across the pages, this kind of stuff. And all that is good stuff. It makes sense. People obviously thought a lot about how to read the words on a page. Um, but they are facets of the truth that if you think about too deliberately are going to mess up your reading. So let's take the subvocalization one as an example. Um, it's, it's really true that it's better to read without subvocalization. I believe that is a, that is a huge truth. Um, and if you've never experienced it before, um, I'm sure some, you know, people have different techniques to try to do this. I think one is listening to music, for example. So if you listen to music while you read, um, you might find that you kind of read more, what you might call photographically. I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that, why I'm calling it photographically in a bit. But you might find that it's harder to hear your subvocalization, right? So that might kind of suppress it. Uh, a technique that I came up with back in the day is to actually um, kind of talk while you're reading, <laughs> which sounds funny. 
right? But if you kind of mumble something, uh, kind of nonsense words while you're looking at the words on the page, then you will see them more photographically as a well uh, as opposed to hearing them in your in your head, right? <laughs> Sounds weird, but just try it. If you kind of mumble some words, but then look at the at the words on the page, so you're mumbling different words. You could just say anything. It forces the mind to only look at the words as opposed to self vocalizing them. It's kind of like uh, when they put a patch over the good eye of someone with a lazy eye and it forces the lazy eye to correct. So it's kind of like a forced thing. If you kind of talk while you're reading, um, it will force the mind to either not at all understand what you're reading or to understand it in a specific way and that's or, or in, a, in a different way, which I would call more photographic. And that different way is better. Now, obviously, that would be really, really distracting to most people. It's it's really hard, whether that's listening to music. Um, that might not be too bad if it was like classical, right? It doesn't have any words to it. You know, but if you tried, you know, maybe mumbling some words, even nonsense words, almost like having a conversation while you're trying to read, I think most people would find that very distracting. Um, but if you try it and you try to read at the same time, you'll notice that your mind is doing something and it's and it's kind of like... If you can do it, it learns to read words the way you would look at someone's face. So when you look at someone's face, you don't analyze it. You're not decomposing it. You're not thinking about any technique. It's the most natural thing ever. You just look at a person's face, right? I mean, usually you're not analyzing someone's face. Uh, or if you look at a tree, you just recognize the tree. It's like looking at words as though they are just a picture, a symbol. And, and if you do that, there's something beautiful happening there. It's like an immediate impression of the words in the mind. It's like you're looking at words, not the way you were taught to read. It's almost like you're not reading at all. You're just looking at the words on the page and it imprints the message in your mind automatically. So why am I talking? And again, this, this episode doesn't have to be about reading. I'm just using this as an example. So we were obviously taught to read, whether you're using a deliberate technique or just the way you were taught, we're taught to read in kind of that sub vocalizing way, right? You look at words, you sound them out, makes sense. Um, it's no different than a golf instructor saying, look, I'm going to teach you how to golf. So I'm going to tell you to step up to the tee. You're going to square your shoulders, square your feet. And you're going to do this and blah, 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 blah. But when you go to swing the club, you can't be thinking about those things. You have to let them go. And that's really what I'm talking about in this episode is letting go of the way you were taught to do something, not because the way you were taught is wrong, but because it can't be part of the actual automatic process by which you would do something, by which you do something effectively or proficiently. The things that you want to be really effective at life in, effective in, in life, uh, they, they have to be, like I said in the, in, in the last episode, very automatic. You know, like right now I am just speaking, I am just talking and I'm going and going. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it's particularly articulate or not, but it flows, right? And hopefully most of it is making sense to you and it's totally off script. And some people might say, you know, well, how do you do that? Because some people really need a script or they really need notes. But I think that's them standing too close to the technique or standing too close to the way they were taught to do something. Like if you're going to give a speech or a talk or a presentation, you were probably told you're supposed to have a slide deck and you're supposed to have points and you're supposed to have structure. And maybe you're supposed to have notes that you glance down on and it's not, you know, it feels very secure to do that. But of course, that's not the way people talk. That's not the way we, you know, if you and I were to go for coffee in a coffee shop, we wouldn't be talking like that. Um, so it's this, it's this idea that the best way to do something is fully automatically. And I don't think it's a, it's a, just an issue of confidence or oh, maybe you're wired like that. I think people chalk things up to that all the time and it's kind of just a crutch. You know, I think we're all far more alike than we are different actually. And, and I get that people can have different talents, but a lot of things, you know, we all recognize faces. We all know a tree when we see it. It doesn't require, you know, we, we all learn to speak our first language um, really without much instruction, you know, other than your parents kind of pointing at objects. It was all very automatic, and these are extremely sophisticated things that we do, right? Facial recognition, object recognition, you know, talking, right? Learning languages, highly complex. So these are not simple things, yet we do them so effectively, and we do them automatically. Um, so, so when you recognize a face, when you recognize a tree, when you are just speaking naturally, you're not using some structure, you're not using some anchor, you're not standing close to a technique. It doesn't mean you didn't maybe learn a technique. Maybe you. I don't know, took some courses on uh, like Toastmasters or whatever it's called, you know, where you, you give public spe uh, speeches and then maybe they give you some techniques. You know, if you wanted to learn to read more effectively, you could take a course on that. You could take a lesson or buy someone's whatever. And it would probably talk about things like suppressing self-vocalization and uh, increasing the peripheral vision. 
If you want to go learn golf, they would tell you how to square the shoulders and square the feet. But at the end of the day, you can't stand close to those techniques when you do the thing or it will mess you up. Um, the best way to read would not be to put music on. That's fine if you do it. Just, But but as a, as a way to suppress the vocalization, it would not be to actually like try to talk at the same time as you're reading. But it will give you a hint at something that is true. Um... And I don't like the word suppress subvocalization because that sounds like you're holding something back. It's it's like this. It's like the subvocalization should should just not be there to begin with. Just like like when we talk, if we go for coffee and we're talking, we're not thinking about anything deliberate. There's no technique. That that golf swing does not. Uh, if it goes well, it's not thinking about all the steps as as some additive mechanism where all those squaring shoulders, squaring feet, looking this way, doing this, that, grip this, do this with your arms, swing. You know. Those are true, but if you were to think about them while you did it, it would mess the golf swing up. It's not an, it's not a, the result that works is not some sum of all those pieces. It's a synthesis where those pieces work together and probably a million other pieces work together intuitively, emotionally, uh, internally in ways that we cannot describe. Like I said in the last episode, it's all about not articulating. If you can articulate perfectly the way you do something, you're probably not that good at the thing, right? If I sit down at the piano, not that I'm an amazing pianist or anything, but, you know, I can play reasonably well, and someone asks me, how do you do it? You know, I struggle to really tell them. I don't really know. I could come up with some kind of narrative about it. Obviously, my, my fingers are kind of doing what what people probably call chords, you know, <laughs> and my fingers go up and down the keyboard with what people probably tend to call scales or something. But I don't care about those things, and I don't read music, and, and I just play by ear, and it just comes naturally. And I think that's true for anything you're really good at. You, you should kind of struggle to articulate it because something is happening. It's almost like you're channeling. It's a synthesis. It's deeper than that. It's holistic. It's the way that we speak our first language. It's the way we notice, recognize trees and faces or get a golf swing to work effectively or read when it's going really well. So I like the reading example because most people are probably reading the way they were taught to read. And that in and of itself is not so bad. There's probably nothing wrong with the way you read. It's probably fast enough. You probably have pretty good comprehension. So maybe you don't care about the reading example, but there might be another example in your life that you do care about. I like the reading example because I like treating reading as a creative thing, meaning uh, I, I like to think about how I can create better ways to do it more effectively. I like retaining information. I like speaking about certain things and, and getting motivated and just having, I mean, most of what I speak about isn't coming from books, but maybe indirectly it is, right? Because it motivates you and it, it you know allows you to blend different pieces of information together in different ways and obviously that's true for like the science journals that I read. And anyway, reading is, is just interesting to me. But it's not so much the content in, in any one piece of thing you're reading like I did in the previous episode. It's, like I said, it doesn't matter what you read actually. It's the creative act of reading itself that I think is so fascinating. Anyways, use it as an analogy or as an example for something you do care about in life. Um, so let's, let's talk more about the reading example and then you can analogize that to something else if you want. Um, so what does it re mean to like read photographically? Well, it, it's, it's like looking at words the way you look at a tree. It's like looking at words the way you look at a face. Um, you weren't taught to recognize a face or to recognize a tree. Or to speak your first language, right? It just happens. It's automatic. And that kind of like speaking at the same time while you look at a word or look at a bunch of words um, will give you a glimpse of a facet of truth, which is there is a better way to look upon words in a book, and it's, it's, it's immediate. You look at them as almost like they were a picture. You're not trying to process, you're not trying to sort of vocalize. It's almost like you're not even trying to read. If you're really reading well, you're not trying to read. One thing you can even do is to look at the words on a page and don't read them. Look at them as though they were a picture. Scan your eyes. It's kind of hard to do because we're, it's very hard to look at words and not read them, right? What does that even mean? But if you can look at, you know, even a sign that you see on a road, if you're driving by, and look at it like a symbol, like a picture, don't read it. If you open a book or a magazine or a blog post, some article, science journal, whatever, look at those words as though you're just looking at words. You're not trying to have the words communicate any message into your brain. And you'll find that if you do that and you get better at scanning your eyes across the page, looking at it almost as though you weren't, you couldn't read the language, if that makes sense, because you're just looking at symbols. Like if I were to go try to read Chinese or something, I would just be looking at symbols. Try to read your native language like that. Like you're just looking at symbols that aren't trying to communicate anything you don't know how to read. <laughs> and then you'll find at the end that you understood it. Okay. It's like 
you weren't trying to read, you weren't trying to do something that you were taught to do, you weren't trying to do any specific technique, you just glanced your eyes casually across the page as though you were just looking at black ink on white paper and nothing else, and yet when you walk away, you understood what you read. So there's something in that. And I think that's the role of techniques that work well. Not to give you a recipe that when you're actually performing or doing the thing, because that will interfere, will get in the way, but to give you a glimpse at something that is more true. So if you suppress, I don't like suppress, but kind of get in the way of subvocalization by talking at the same time as you read or maybe putting some music on, you shouldn't do that while you're actually reading, but it will give you a glimpse into a better way for you to assimilate information on a page. And we can use this for anything else in life. Techniques are kind of more, they're better thought of as something as a setup. Like you could imagine going up to the tee on golf and maybe beginning by squaring your feet and squaring your shoulders and getting your arms ready, but then letting go. Now it's not about the technique. Stop thinking about that technique. Now you gotta feel your way through it. I think that's true for reading. So you could come up to, you know, I could teach you or other people could teach you maybe better techniques for reading if for some reason you wanted to treat that more as a creative act like I do. You're interested in just more effectively assimilating the information and speaking about it, whatever, visualizing it in your mind. So I can, I can, I can talk to you about techniques for getting you know, uh, in the way, if you will, of the subvocalization by speaking at the same time. Uh, we can talk about uh, increasing your peripheral vision by raising your eyes above the words. And so you're kind of uh, quite literally using your peripheral vision to look at it. So it increases the span or the amount of text you see at the same time. Um, there are techniques that you can use to kind of visualize things in your mind. Those will give you aspects or facets of truth that maybe you didn't think about before. And uh, they are very true. But if you tried to do them deliberately when you went to read, they would get in the way and they would mess up because you wouldn't be able to focus on what you're reading. So I think this is, is really true of anything in life. Techniques are best thought of as something to give you as something that gives you a window into aspects of things that are true. And uh, if somebody has a technique to, to, to read or to do art, right? Or to paddle a canoe or to sketch with pencils, to make paintings, to build businesses. These are probably good things for the most part, depending on who's talking, I guess. But if they've had some reasonable success in their own life, then that those techniques probably do speak to something true, but they are not a recipe. And if you try to use the technique deliberately, they are going to get in the way of, of performing automatically. You have to let go of the technique. Techniques are good, but you have to let go of them when you perform. And, and uh, if you don't want to consider them techniques, just think about it as the way you were taught something. It's always kind of a technique, right? You were taught to read. You were taught to maybe do science a certain way. You were taught to do art a certain way. Uh, pick your thing, however you were taught to do something. And it does become second nature, but you still tend to hold on to that. And if you don't treat the thing as a creative act where you're actually trying to get better at it, then you just kind of stay doing the way you were taught to do something. Learn to step away from the way you were taught to do something. Not because the way you were taught is wrong, but because doing that too deliberately as a recipe can actively interfere with something. And you might even be doing it deliberately as, second, as a second nature, which sounds a bit oxymoronic or ironic, right? Like, isn't second nature supposed to be not doing something deliberately? But, you know, you might be kind of stuck in that systematic kind of way of doing something because that's the way you were taught and then you kind of become second nature of it and then you add it and then you don't think about it anymore. Um, challenge yourself to become better at the things that you really want to become better at by stretching yourself so that you become adaptive because we're adaptive creatures. So if it was reading, it would be maybe trying to go faster or trying to have better comprehension or maybe both, or maybe even slower with better comprehension. It doesn't matter. It's not really about the speed. It's just more effective. Define what more effective means for you, let's say in reading, and stretch yourself and, uh, and listen to some of the techniques that people have. You know, you're not necessarily trying to become a speed reader or anything like that, but, you know, there is something about getting in the way of subvocalization. There is in the way there is something about increasing the peripheral vision. There is something about looking at things photographically, the way we do naturally and so many other things. And that's what you should be doing. At the end of the day, you know, the message here is really like whatever it is you want to be proficient at, you should be doing it as naturally as you do the other things that are natural, like speaking your first language, like recognizing a tree, recognizing a face. Like that. That's how you should be doing reading. That's how you should be swinging the golf club. That's how you should be building businesses and communicating and giving talks and all that you know, automatic, very effective. Uh, 
And there's, there's something almost magical about it. It seems magical because we're just taught to do things so deliberately and by design. And when you let go of those designs, you realize just how powerful the, the mind is. Um, you know, like I talked about memory techniques before and things like the memory palace. And, uh, you know, again, if you do that too deliberately, it can kind of get in your way. But if you realize the power of anchoring on things in three dimensions in your mind, all of a sudden, you know, you could sit down and memorize multiple decks of cards in one go like that. I didn't even know that was possible, that kind of thing. Like, it's just amazing what the mind can do. And it's true for reading. If you actually assimilated the words on the page the way your mind is capable of doing, you'd be whipping through those pages. And it doesn't have to be fast, but you'd be comprehending and probably whipping through those pages pretty quick. And uh, you'd walk away with the true essence of what was on the page, and you'd be able to kind of recommunicate that in your own way and synthesize that with the different things you read. It would probably far surpass your current reading capability. If you're not interested in treating reading as a creative act, then pick something else, right? You're probably way better at the golfing, way better at the canoeing, way better at the sculpting and the art, and building a business and giving speeches and programming, you know, making software, typing, you know, whatever. There's an automatic way to do it. It typically is a lot faster. It's far more effective. It just flows. That's where you need to be with the things that you want to be known for and particularly proficient at. Okay, that's it for this episode. Thanks so much for joining me. And uh, until next time, take care.